MGX Minerals is revolutionizing the new energy economy with patented lithium extraction technology, replacing traditional solar evaporation using low-cost, low-energy nanofiltration. The first system of this paradigm shift technology is currently being commissioned. MGX Minerals trades on the CSE, symbol XMG, the OTCQB, symbol MGXMF, and Frankfurt, symbol 1MG. For more information, visit our website, mgxminerals.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Hilliard Macbeth, author of the book, When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. He's also a portfolio manager and financial advisor in Edmonton. Welcome back to the show, Hilliard. Nice to be here in July. And you have your new book out. The second edition, yes. Uh, same title, When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash, second edition. And I've added a bunch of uh, really interesting new material. Uh, one of the things that happened in the three years since the first edition came out was I learned an awful lot from talking to dozens and dozens of Canadians about different things. And um, and then also I did a bunch of research into why do these bubbles form? Why do authorities let these bubbles form? Uh, given what we know about the damage that's caused by the crash that inevitably comes after a bubble. And uh, so it's all in there. I encourage people to have a look. I do wonder, uh, first of all, they allow the bubbles to happen, and then after the bubble has burst, they come in with you know, very draconian legislation in British Columbia, a 20% foreign buyer's tax, the city of Vancouver, a 1% tax on vacant property. Do governments come in, I mean, they want to give the appearance they're doing something, but can they really control a market? They don't really control very much, you know, and people think that they do. But, um, you know, I, I actually had to go all the way back to 1776 with Inv- Adam Smith and the Invisible Hand. And it turns out that basically um, the, the last, uh, I guess, since Thatcher and Reagan, the prominent, predominant feeling is just let the market sort it out. And, uh, and then... As happened recently in Vancouver, when things get so far out of out of uh, out of um, reality, the government has to step in and do something. But it's far too late, and it's and it's, of course it's far too draconian as well. So they're they're in the business of um, basically not being involved until uh, the writing's on the wall. And uh, but it's too late to mitigate the damage. So they end up being the cleanup crew. After the disaster hits, and uh, and and the, the reason for that, there's actually some pretty strong reasons for it. There's a philosophical reason in economics that suggests that the market is efficient, and which of course is not true at all. Uh, otherwise, bubbles wouldn't wouldn't form and burst. Uh, but people still believe in it, and uh, and then also there's an awful lot of vested interest as well. I mean, there's the lenders, there's the people that own the the land that they're trying to sell. Some people, you know, have owned land for 30 years before they get the chance to sell it in the middle of a bubble for a huge price increase. So they um, they put a lot of pressure on the authorities and the politicians to not um, spoil the party just when it's when it's um, when it's going the strongest. There's a st- saying about central bankers, and of course they don't have they have the least amount of control probably of anybody, but that they're supposed to take the punch bowl away just when the party's getting getting really um, exciting. But of course, they never do. So, uh, and uh, so we end up with the hangover afterwards. And uh, so we haven't really seen the impact of some of these new measures yet. Um, we're starting to see the impact. But uh, and one of the things that I discovered just in the last couple of days is uh, just looking at 1.5 million dollar houses in West Van and North Van. There's over 500 listings, and there's just not very many sales. So. It would have seemed that these measures, that the, like the foreign buyers tax, and that have, have actually started to to dig in and uh, have a big impact in making the foreign buyer disappear. And then there's other reasons too. There's a crackdown in China. There's a, possibly a crackdown in Canada as well in terms of some of the money laundering and illegal uh, movement of funds. Also, uh, the foreign buyer tax though may not end up being legal at all. We do have. A woman who's a Chinese citizen who received her education in Saskatchewan and lives in Burnaby, BC, 
and she had to pay over $80,000 more for her condo. And she said it's a racist policy built on nationality and uh, maybe in violation of the Canadian Charter of Rights and also maybe in violation of World Trade Organization rules as well. So that'll be an interesting court case to watch. Yeah, I wonder if it'll, I wonder if she'll succeed because as long as it's not, I, I'm sure it's just identified as a non, non-resident, but, um, it's, uh, you know, they might have to, uh, fight it all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. Who knows? Uh, but the government does have the, uh, the right to tax and, uh, they'll probably assert that view. And, uh, I think there's probably, I, I've seen polls that indicate there's a lot of support for that tax among, um, among Vancouver residents and BC residents. But again, it, it may violate international trade rules. So, and yeah, that, apparently uh, she's willing uh, to WTO, take it that far. The, the yeah. whole international trade structure that's been set up since the Second World War and built more and more. And then in 2001, China was admitted to the WTO. It seems to be unraveling <laughs> at the moment. So how much longer it's going to last, we don't know. There's been so many violations and, um, uh, you know, different different people, but mostly the U.S. have been pushing pretty hard to uh, to change some of the rules. So uh, it's a it's a it's a very uncertain time in the in the World Trade Organization, you know, and that's one of the things uh, we haven't talked about yet. But the the uh, the fear of NAFTA falling apart um, now with the New Mexico election uh, happening July the first, um, there's no guarantee that NAFTA will continue, and that would be a devastating uh, blow to Ontario and and generally to Canada as well because exports Canada Canada kind of lives and dies by exports whether it be oil from Alberta or lumber and hydroelectric power from BC or cars from and auto parts from Ontario we we uh we export a lot it's a huge amount of our economy maybe 40 45% of our economy with the money laundering report that came out in British Columbia how much did it affect Real estate, I think a lot, and I, you know, the the report was focused just on casinos, which is, uh, of course, um, generally people that have cash, like hundred dollar bills, trying to convert it to something more uh, tangible, like real estate or deposit at a bank or something like that. And um, there's pretty strict rules about walking into a bank with a bunch of cash, so they they use the casinos, I guess, to uh, it was a, it was an ex RCMP guy named German who um, who did it, and but he was just looking at the casinos, and then shortly after that came out, um, a Globe Mail reporter, Kathleen Toms- Tomlinson, uh, came out with a report that indicated that the uh, the real estate uh, money that's coming in from outside of Canada has uh, been using the banks to move the money, and um, that's um, that's something that's required to be reported under FinTrack. And uh, the money anti-money laundering rules that Canada's agreed to with several other countries. But Canada's been singled out by Transpar- Transparency International as one of the most lax regimes in the world. So we're supposed to enforce these anti-money laundering laws, but we're not really enforcing it. And if the report by Kathleen Tomlinson is correct, and I suspect it is, the Canadian banks have been involved, which is a, a huge new... Um, most of us are not that have researched this are not surprised that uh, this has been discovered, but it'll be very interesting to see what the uh, how far the authorities are willing to go to to crack down on that. So this is the um, the fifty thousand dollar limit from China moving money out of China, and uh, obviously people were buying three million dollar houses, so it's pretty hard to buy, pretty hard to do that without some help, and uh, and pretty hard to buy Canadian real estate without help from the major lenders so it's not a surprise but it's never as far as I know it's never been reported in a, in a major publication like the Gold Mail that this has been going on this is the first time well, I, I did a story about it uh, again yeah Transparency International the number one uh, money laundering country in the world is the US Canada number two yeah yeah and it's uh, you know and, and, and it's just um, amazing but part of the Part of the story that came out in the Globe recently was that um, there's so many people that are benefiting from this that nobody wants to, you know, be the one that blows the whistle, takes the punch bowl away. Just when the party's getting really good, 
nobody wants to be the wet blanket that uh, that um, throws a damper on everything. So yeah, I just watched a documentary on the startup of the New York Stock Exchange, and they had absolutely no rules, but they didn't want to put rules in because it made so many people rich. Yeah, and I think the dream was, and again, this might this might apply to Vancouver real estate as well. It isn't just the people that are laundering money that benefit. It's um, people that have owned houses for a long time in BC, and then you know their their three hundred thousand dollar house becomes a one point five million dollar house. Um, a lot of them were were in favor of it as well. So uh, really, nobody wants to to spoil the party. <laughs> And that, and that's the, uh, that's why the authorities and politicians and different people are so reluctant to, uh, to jump in. But I, but I have, um, in our industry, in the investment industry, we are governed by the same rules. And when you read the list of suspicious transactions that are required to be reported, and the fines include many very large numbers, as well as jail time as well, um, you can go to jail for not reporting if you're sitting in a, in a, in a financial advisor's seat or a bank, banker's seat. Lawyers are exempt, but they're the only ones that are exempt. Everybody else, realtors are included, notary publics included, bankers and financial advisors. Um, it's pretty serious stuff. So it'll be very interesting to see if they if they um, enforce those rules or if they continue to look the other way. We'll have more with Hilliard Macbeth right after this. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain's Brunswick property is located in the Ridout Shear Zone in Ontario, with grab samples running as high as 32 grams per tonne gold. A follow-up drill program to test numerous targets located by recent groundwork is planned for early 2018. Please visit our website at rmroyalty.com. Vatic Ventures Corp. is a potash exploration company focused on the Korat Basin in Thailand, the world's largest undeveloped potash resource. Vatic's management has extensive potash exploration and development experience in Thailand. Vatic will have marketing advantage compared to Western producers. Drill program commences this spring. Vatic trades on the TSX Venture, symbol VCV, and on Frankfurt, symbol V8V2. Visit our website, vaticventures.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Hilliard Macbeth. Hilliard, the U.S. has asked its allies to uh, not buy any oil from Iran. And now they are also talking about a pipeline and they're opposed to it. Can you maybe explain? Yeah, so the um, the U.S. is trying to block this Nord Stream 2 pipeline, it's called. It's going from Russia into lands in Germany and it'll carry a massive amount of natural gas, most of which comes from Siberia. And uh, Europe is very dependent on Russian natural gas, and as well as Turkey um, is dependent as well for heating in the winter. They've done a great job of solar panels and wind turbines, way beyond anything that um, North America's done. But that doesn't um, that doesn't help with heat in the winter. So, so uh, I know from talking to people in Germany a few years ago that they were very in- interested in getting off the dependency on Russia. But now it looks like they're. The ties are getting closer, and uh, the U.S. would like to see their liquefied natural gas industry, which is just starting to export uh, loads of liquefied natural gas by ship, uh, would like to see that industry get get going. But the Russian gas is always going to be cheaper, especially if this pipeline gets built. So the U.S. is trying to stop it, but it looks like it's going to go ahead. Europe, most of the people in Europe are in favor of it. And it would um, it would solve a problem for, for many decades to come. Um, and, you know, there's really no shortage of gas in the world. It's just a question of, of um, the U.S. has got a surplus. Canada's got a huge surplus. Australia, um, Qatar in the Middle East, and uh, Russia. So uh, it costs money to liquefy it. It costs money to ship it in a ship. So a pipeline uh, would be cheaper. It's going The pipeline's going to go through the Baltic Sea. But it is a little puzzling why... Um, the U.S. government's so uh, vehemently against it, um, other than I guess the, the answer is promoting their own very uh, small but growing liquefied natural gas industry. Well, it's interesting, too. They said they want their allies to, to block Iranian oil and to block this pipeline, but what kind of allies are they going to have when they're slapping tariffs on their trade? Yeah, I think the Europe... I, I read uh, yesterday that they're sending... Uh, the U.S. is sending a... a um, 
a delegation to the uh, Farnborough Air Show, where a lot of big orders for new planes are being announced usually every year around this time. And uh, but at the same time, they're they're blaming Europe for not spending enough money on their own defense. And uh, there's been letters apparently gone out to all NATO allies demanding that they spend more money on NATO. So, you know, if you think about Europe, they're going to, um, they're probably more likely to want to buy, uh, if they have to spend more money on their own defense and their own um, uh, infrastructure, they're much more likely to buy from other Europeans or even Russians uh, given the bad relations with the U.S. today. So I don't know if the U.S. strategy is going to work for them. I think uh, they're more likely to drive Europe into the, into the arms of Russia and other countries like that than to, um, than to uh, make new friends by, by criticizing and, and demanding all these uh, changes without negotiating. And uh, so it, it's um, very interesting times. But Europe... You know, their their tariffs are a problem for Europe, but Europe has got an awful lot of trade within Europe, and uh, so they're not as dependent on the U.S. as Canada is. Canada is much more dependent, and China is much more dependent on selling to the U.S. than uh, than Europe is. Uh, Mexico just elected a leftist president. How is that going to affect NAFTA talks? Do you think? Well, it'd be interesting. He had, he's, I, I read a little bit about it. I'm not, um, but he, I, I did, was surprised to see that he, um, he's, he's quite careful not to criticize Trump. But, um, but his book, the title of his book that he put out in the lot recently, uh, before he got elected was Listen Trump is the title of it. So, so he certainly, um, wants to take him on. And I think every country that is treated uh, badly by the U.S. president, like Canada and Mexico have been. Um, interesting how he he's so friendly to countries like Russia and North Korea, and so so uh, combative with with allies like Canada and Mexico. But the leaders of Canada and Mexico don't have any choice but to fight back. They can't uh, be seen to be uh, kowtowing to to Trump. It's just not politically um, viable for them. So. Uh, it, it, I saw um, some information about NATO saying that the election of this New Mexico leader is, is um, likely to make NATO more difficult to to uh, resolve. One of the things they're demanding, the U.S. is demanding of Mexico, is that the wages be tripled or quadrupled in Mexico. Currently, the Mexican workers make about $4 an hour, and they want something like $16 an hour. Um, that isn't a problem in Canada because our wages are already much higher than lots of places in the U.S., but in Mexico, of course, the wages are much lower. So uh, it, it's going to be a tough, tough uh, battle between Mexico and, and the U.S. to get a, a resolution. I, I, I think most of the people that are knowledgeable about this, and I'm, I'm not that knowledgeable, but uh, what I read, it's unlikely that the NAFTA agreement will survive this. And that's got big implications for Canada. We have to... Uh, Canada has to find other trading partners, but there really isn't any, any other uh, trading partner to find. There's just nothing close by that we can uh, that we can replace. The United States is basically uh, irreplaceable for Canada as an export destination. We'll have more with Hilliard Macbeth right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're chatting with Hilliard Macbeth. Hilliard, Tesla, uh, good news coming out of their uh, auto plant? Well, they, they had Elon Musk had set a target of... Um of uh, 5,000 cars a week, um, which he, I think he was supposed to have hit like last year, but then he, he kept saying, well, I'll do it in the first quarter. So now he said, we'll do it in the second quarter of 2018. June 30th was the end of that quarter. 
and he managed to reach 5,300 cars according to the announcement that came out. And it was an SEC filing, so it's probably pretty accurate. And um, I've also seen three Tesla Model 3s in, in Edmonton in the last two days. So they, they're not only are they manufacturing them, but they're actually getting them out. Um, I have my reservation in. Uh, put a thousand dollars down of probably a, whenever it came out. I think it's uh, a year or two ago now, but I haven't uh, completed the order yet. And they, apparently, people like me that are sort of sitting waiting to complete the order are being asked to put another twenty five hundred dollars in. So I don't, I haven't, I haven't got that request yet. But I don't know what we'll, what we'll do about that. Um, but I would like to see the car first. But there's a lot of skeptics about Tesla. A lot of skeptics generally about electric cars. Um, but they are easier to manufacture, and they require much, much less maintenance, as well as no gasoline, of course. So, uh, in the long run, I think, uh, in spite of the growing troubles and the, you know, the teething problems that Tesla's having, in the long run, they've kind of got the trend of history on their side, and and uh, you know, there's there's a lot of people that's skeptical about Elon Musk, but he has accomplished an awful lot. And most people don't realize there's a strong Canadian connection with Elon Musk. He went to went to university in Canada, worked for a Canadian bank in Toronto, Ontario, and uh, was so uh, amazed at their lack of competence that he ended up founding a predecessor to PayPal because of it. But then he switched to electric cars. And outer space. And outer space. And people said he'd never land a rocket on a floating platform and he and he did that so um so it's a uh, i guess he, i guess my view is um that um it's it, he sets himself very high hurdles but he's really the electric car is much easier to manufacture than the um the gasoline internal combustion engine car because the internal combustion engine is a very complicated um item and electric cars really don't have anything like that. In that they've got a powerful computer, they've got a battery, and one or two electric motors, and not much else. So there's um, it's a much simpler task to to build these things. And I think once he gets up and running, a million cars a year would be uh, would be easily easy to do. Um, the target for that was 2020. So he's actually got about a year and a half to go to get to a million cars. I don't, I don't think he will get to that, but. He'll need to build several more factories before that. Uh, but um, at a million cars a year, the company could actually make quite a bit of money because um, and actually justify its current stock position. And of course, the stock price today is extremely expensive. It's about it's over three hundred dollars a share, and it gives it a market cap of about sixty billion dollars. So that's a pretty big market cap for a company that's only producing about a quarter of a million cars a year so far. But it it could um, it could grow into its market cap. I think the Model Three is the big hurdle that it has, and uh, if it's successful after a few hiccups, then uh, people might be comfortable paying that much for the stock. Hilliard, thank you so much for chatting with us. Nice talking to you again. My guest has been Hilliard Macbeth, author of the new book "When the Bubble Burst: Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash." You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet popular youtube channel is talk digital network questions for the show or our guests can be sent to info at howstreet.com i'm jim goddard thanks for listening comments made on howstreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time Available online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.